hopefully that will help with some flipping a little bit. Yeah. yeah. The House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee will come to order. Madam Clerk, would you please read in the letter from Speaker Tate? A letter dated January 12, 2023, to Mr. Rich Brown, Clerk, Michigan House of Representatives. Dear Mr. Clerk, I appoint the following members of the 102nd Legislature to the Standing Committee for the 2023-2024 Legislative Session, Local Government and Municipal Finance. John Fitzgerald, Chair. Aaron Burns, Majority Vice Chair. Jen Hill, Julie Rogers, Kelly Breen, Jason Hoskins, Veronica Pies, Nate Shannon, Dale Zorn, Minority Vice Chair, Brad Paulquette, Bob Bizot, Mike Harris, Dave Preston. Sincerely, Joe Tate, Speaker of the House. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Would you please call the roll? Chair Fitzgerald? Here. Representative Burns? Here. Shannon? Present. Green? Present. Rogers? Here. Hill? Here. Hoskins? Here. Pies? Here. Zorn? Here. Paulquette? Here. Bizot? Here. Harris? Here. Preston? Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. We need a motion to adopt Wednesday at 12 noon in room 519 of the House Office Building as the appointed meeting schedule for the committee, or for the full committee. Rep. Burns moves to adopt the operating schedule for the House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Fitzgerald? Yes. Representative Burns? Yes. Shannon? Yes. Green? Aye. Rogers? Yes. Hill? Yes. Hoskins? Yes. Pies? Yes. Zorn? Yes. Paquette? Bizot? Yes. Harris? Yes. Preston? Yes. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. The schedule is adopted. The House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee will follow Chapter 4 stated in the House Standing Rules that were adopted on the House floor. Now, as we get going here today, I'd like to thank everybody for being here this morning, or this afternoon, I guess, rather. I was just saying, I'm going to mess that up every single time, because we, we arrive here in the morning and we start in the afternoon. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody for being here and for taking an interest in this committee and the work of this body. Um, I myself have a background uh, uh, of a few years uh, in local government, as well as a number of our members here uh, on both sides of the rostrum. Um, I'd really like to point out, though, that local government and municipal work has taken a, a new shine uh, in the last few years. And there's become a, uh, there's become a great interest, uh, both statewide and nationally, about the work of our local bodies. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for our local elected officials, appointed officials, those who are employees. And I hope that this body here will help to support those folks do that job well in service to their communities, and I look forward to working with you all in the next two years. With that, we are going to begin today uh, with our organizational meeting with taking uh, in a presentation from the Michigan Municipal League. So I'd like to invite you to uh, join us here um, for your presentation. I believe everyone has been provided with a paper copy. If you do need one, please flag us down here. It's great to see you all this morning, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Good, great to see you too. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, members of the committee, uh, John Lamacchia, Director of State and Federal Affairs with the Michigan Municipal League. Absolutely thrilled uh, to be here today and help you kick off uh, local government for the 2023-2024 legislative session. Um, we're going to go through a variety of things today, and I will make sure that we get uh, a number of topics covered all the way from municipal finance, which we're happy to see as a portion of this committee, to some of just some the core basic things we do organizationally. But more importantly than anything else, for those of you that may be familiar with us and others that may be unfamiliar with us, really understanding what we have done organizationally over the last four years as we've transitioned, as many others have, um, to sort of the next phase in what we do to accommodate and meet the needs that we face today is going to be a really important part of this conversation. And I'm going to start by uh, introducing uh, our team here. And I have the distinct pleasure to be joined by two wonderful women with me today, uh, Harisana and Jen. Uh, and then as you see on the screen, we also have Betsy Richardson, who is our capital office coordinator. 
And for the first time, we are going to introduce one Dave Hodgkins, uh, who literally joined the team three hours and six minutes ago. <laughs> um, and uh, so he is uh, in the middle of his onboarding process, but this is our state and federal affairs team at the organization. We are willing and able to work and partner with you on a variety of topics. We look forward to that over the next two years. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Jen to start talking about our organization a little bit. So in your slides, you'll see um, the league and kind of our journey from inception. Um, we were put together when, and when a few mayors got together, we're talking about like topics and decided, hey, maybe we should make this a, for, a more formal um, thing. And so the league was uh, established back in 1899. We had our first league president out of the uh, city of Saginaw at that time. And then we opened a Lansing office our main office is down in Ann Arbor. Um, we are around uh, 50 staff now, but we have, you know, your traditional organizational HR, finance, um, and but then we have our comms team down there. Here in Lansing really is our legislative team. Uh, we have uh, some of our membership uh, staff here as well as we have a foundation and you can see that our foundation actually you're gonna talk about that I'll get ahead of myself <laughs> um, and we have flowed up here until uh, 2022 and we are approaching our 125th anniversary which is something we think is is a great accomplishment in looking at supporting communities across uh, the state and uh, I started out with this we kind of gave a presentation yesterday don't want to say the exact same things but one of the exciting things about working with and for local government is we are all from places. I mean, we're all from somewhere here in this state. So regardless of what side of the aisle you're sitting on or what, you're from somewhere. And local government is intricate to providing why you want to live there, why you want to stay there, the services. And um, at the core uh, is local government when we start talking about place and what makes Michigan um, a place to invest and to, and to be. Good afternoon. So in addition to our long standing history, we are also an incredibly broad organization with many different affiliate groups, many different opportunities for training and extended resources for our members so we can holistically meet the needs of local government. So going back in the timeline, you look at 1930, we started our Michigan Municipal Executives, our cohort of city managers. And then following in 1935, helped, we started to continue in the direction of providing training and immediate hands-on resources to our communities. And with the development of further affiliates like the MAMAs, the Michigan Association of Municipal Attorneys, Michigan Association of Municipal Clerks in 1939, the Michigan Association of Mayors in 1939 as well. And then looking towards the last 30 years of the 20th century, we really started leaning in on what our members needed, responding to the moment, responding to the changing times, realizing that communities were growing and getting more complex and dealing with more complex issues. We have our liability pool, our workers' compensation fund, and our legal defense fund. We also have Michigan Women in Municipal Government, which started in 1978. And if you remember from Jen's previous slide, 1979 was the first year we had our first female president of the league. So we've been proactively looking for opportunities to represent our members in changing times. You'll see in the future, and as John, uh, sorry, Jed mentioned, our foundation, which is our 501c3 arm of the league that does programs like Bridge Builders. Some of our local folks might be familiar with that, as well as My Water Navigator, which is a program that we stood up last year that supports through technical assistance communities that are looking at accessing the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund and other forms of federal investments that can be difficult to grasp because of just technical and capacity issues for our members. And then looking in the 2000s, NBC Leo, Michigan Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials. Again, identifying and creating space for local elected leaders so they can do their job best, do their job in community, and build off of the relationships with one another. And then one that we're very proud of most recently, the 1650 program, which works to advance the role of women in municipal government. We realize that 50% of Michigan's population is made up of women, but only 16% is made of those roles of manager roles, excuse me, in local government are held by women. So over the past five years, we have dived, dove deep into that commitment of training, networking, supporting women across the state who have now gone on to be incredible leaders throughout their communities and really working to build up the ladder for those who are coming after them as well. Yeah, so much of what we do is about responding to our members' needs, uh, but what guides that? And that, that, like any organization, is guided by our mission. 
I'm going to take a, a moment here to read it because it's critically important to how you will view us and what's reflected in the actions that we take. The Michigan Municipal League is dedicated to making Michigan's communities better by thoughtfully innovating programs, energetically connecting ideas and people, actively serving members with resources and services, and passionately inspiring positive change in Michigan's greatest centers of potential, its communities. And we believe that. We live that every single day in what we do from our advocacy to the way in which we interact with our members to the way in which we interact with our board to the way we run our programs and more importantly the way we interact with people at the community level because it's not just about the organization it's about those that we represent and what they do in their individual and unique places which is why we say we love where you live uh, and that really matters uh, at the end of the day because as Jen said you know everybody is from somewhere and not all communities are the same, and we shouldn't expect them to be the same, nor should we expect you know, solutions to always fit one particular size or one particular problem. Allowing them to embrace that uniqueness is so critical to what we do, which was really at the core of placemaking when we began talking about that a little over a decade ago and really believe we've been a leader in that space. You know, but placemaking, much like anything else, needs to evolve, right? And in that evolution of place, uh, we've started to really talk about the concept of community wealth building. So community wealth building, just like John said, it's placemaking but with an equity lens and truly focusing on the human experience and what makes all of our communities exciting, unique, vibrant, attractive places to live. We, we want to focus around a sense of belonging. What brings people together? What makes people stay? What, what makes people grow? You know, we know that people choose place first before they choose any other aspect of their lives. I'm thinking about where, you know, I want my children to go to school, how easy it is to acquire and sustain my home, how supportive the resources are around me in the community that I choose to live in. Um, those are all priorities. And, and when we look at that from a sense of what people want and also what people's role is in that, you start to realize that there's an excitement to be participatory, to be engaged, that folks want self-ownership. And so the work is local. You know, we're giving local opportunity to folks to really decide what they want to do, where they want to be, and building off of those things are intrinsically connected on that. And so to do that, it takes us looking at new metrics. It takes us to a place of looking at things a little bit differently than we have before. And our wheel helps illustrate that. So if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, you need safety, you need comfort, you need security and self-assurance. This is the same thing, you know, if we are in a community with, you know, solid and sustainable infrastructure, understanding of our sustainable environment and respecting that and utilizing to our best ability, a place that's financially secure and also has the public safety services to match that, we holistically have created a community where people want to be. And so when we create and balance, economic prosperity, of sense of place, all of these things together. This is where community wealth building occurs and really grows in the sense of we're able to provide meaningful things to people, meaningful opportunities, and, and balance that across all things that are directly adjacent. You know, we are in many different committees as the league. This, of course, is our home base, but it may not be directly aligned. We find ourselves working collaboratively with different partners across the state, different industries and different issue areas because we believe that everything in this wheel is directly correlated and equally important to sustaining great opportunity in our local communities. Yeah, so we really, engage in the aspect that communities are the heart of opportunity. Um, we are the host for families, businesses, and visitors, and as our executive director says, our role as communities and leaders in those communities is to be the host of the party, not the life of the party. And, you know, when you actually think about that, that makes a lot of sense for the role that we play in local government. How we interact with our residents and our businesses and our visitors is to incorporate uh, environments that attract and retain those individuals. And the more we do that, the better off we become. Building resilient and adaptable systems, whether that's from infrastructure to the way in which our financial structure is at the, at the local level, to the way in which we lift people up in our communities, whether that be in their neighborhood or in their schools. Addressing the social and economic needs becomes really important. Because while this committee may be focused on municipal finance, you know, the idea of economics in local government is more than just the way in which we balance our budget. 
It's the opportunities that we can prevent to pre provide to people along the way. Do they have access to capital, right? Are they able to, to access, you know, um, uh, an opportunity to buy a particular building, to open up a small business, to do these types of things? And so while sometimes when you look at local government, you think about those direct four walls of city or village or county hall, we work very, very hard to be much more than that, right? How do we actually interact with those that are going to take advantages of the opportunities that that community represents, no matter what that community is trying to provide? And ultimately, we believe that we can be the epicenter for competition and growth. And I think as we have learned over the course of time, there are many things that we do know. Right. And we know without a doubt we are a knowledge based economy right now. We know that education counts and degrees matter. We know technology now more than ever allows people to work from anywhere and they need a place that they want to work from. Our population is mobile. Right. Both because of changing technology and the different things that they get to do in their workplace. Place attracts people. If we don't know that yet, we're missing something. Right? If we don't recognize the fact that young people more than ever are looking for the place they want to be first before they look for a job and we're not adjusting to that, we will fall behind. And we are in a worldwide competition for talent. And I think that is evident. And I think there have been steps that have been taken. As we can see already, this legislative cycle, we're taking last legislative cycle, and even the legislative cycle before that, that cross political bounds and who is in leadership, and really focus on driving home the point that Michigan and the places that we represent within the state is where people want to be. And we play a large role in ensuring that those places are available to them. So as an organization, as local government, we really touch issues across the, the, the bandwidth of issues. Um, when I first started with the league, I remember sitting in a meet and greet um, with a couple of my colleagues, John being one, and, and they said something about we don't do um, human services or really education. And I had already been in education um, dealing with deed restrictions on schools, and we have some municipalities that have municipal ambulance services. I was like, you have to stop saying that because we really are in all. And usually when we do show up in some of those communities, people are like, what are you doing here? So, but to that point, we have tried to really focus um, our areas of interest and prioritize. And so really, number one is protecting community-specific solutions and resources. Um, because if you think about just the, um, the diversity of places sitting on this committee right now, they're different. They have different needs. They have different solutions. And really, um, a lot of times, we hear about an issue, and there's a statewide solution that is uh, recommended. Um, but really, it might be a particular issue in a particular area that really might not even need legislative action. Um, but that one-size-fits-all very rarely works. Um, for local units of government. Uh, modernizing governance and structure, as well as investing in human capital, and we're gonna dive into these a little bit. Um, but one of my favorites, uh, you know, to work on because it, it's so incremental to success going forward is robust housing and economic development opportunities. And robust housing is just on a scale of whether you're talking about the affordability factor, the lack of stock, um, the lack of labor, the cost of materials. I mean, it really goes around the sector um, of, of needs when it comes to housing. So we're going to highlight a couple of items under each of those four buckets. And, and I think what's important to recognize here is while, yes, as an organization, we do have some priorities. Yes, we would love you to work collectively to put more money into revenue sharing. But a big part of what our role here is to act as partners. Right. Our role is to work with you and see what your thoughts and your ideas and your priorities are and help align them with ours and find solutions that are going to make impacts. So there are a lot of specifics that we could talk to and say, hey, we really like you to do this. But in our first touch with you here today is understanding that we are here as partners. We are here to work with you to make things better and on those collective goals, hopefully find outcomes that's going to make every one of our communities better along the way. Now, on the revenue sharing piece, I would be remiss, though, if I did not talk about the revenue sharing trust fund and the need to secure resources, which many of you had heard from us beforehand, and we won't dive deep into that. 
But this idea of taking revenue sharing where it sits today and securing that to make sure that communities have a consistent stream of revenue in a way that is predictable and understanding is critically important to the way we provide services, whether that be public safety with police, fire, and EMS, or the way we operate our parks and recreations departments to ensure people have access to opportunities right outside their door. And then property taxes. You know, one of two, and because this, this committee, again, has a, a real focused and sharp lens on municipal finance, it's one of the two biggest factors that funds local government. And so property taxes, and you will see on the next slide, there's a mention of Headley and Proposal A. The interaction of how these things work and how they fund those programs and those facilities within our, our community becomes critical. And recessionary pressures, as we've seen previously, has a drastic impact on that. So how do we make sure we make our communities more sustainable and more resilient to the economic pressures that we face, whether they are those that we can control on our own or whether those that are outside of our control and that we need to be nimble to adjust to? Before we move on, we'll talk about just really quickly again that, that local decision making. I mean, municipalities are required by law already to go through the master planning process to come up with goals and visions for their communities and then to again reaffirm or update the, that plan every five years. And so protecting the local decision making around being able to implement those goals and, and that vision that has had community input along the way um, is very important to making our places uh, unique and attractive um, and not all the same. Modernizing local governance and, and structure, uh, you know, one of the things that we would like to work on um, and started working on previously is looking at the Open Meetings Act and, and really modernizing um, that act. Uh, there were some updates over COVID. There were some changes. We know lots of things were happening then. We actually struck out some language that had a, a, an impact that none of us knew um, was going to happen but also looking at a virtual attendance. Um, very open to guardrails because even um, as a league, you know, we are not asking for our members to be able to go winter in another state um, and still participate in that process. Um, but looking at when they're, someone really does want to participate in their local process, but they have a sick family member um, or, you know, they feel under the weather, not quite sure what's going on. So putting, again, the discussion and working with our other local government partners on this issue. Um, we're looking forward to continuing those conversations into this next session. Cybersecurity has been a growing topic for us municipally. And as Jen just mentioned, we're looking at unique ways to modernize local governments and also to lean into this digital era. And with that comes with analyzing and understanding our cyber posture as local units of government. We have full control in our internal IT systems from our website management to the systems that we use for billing uh, and other mechanisms, but that does open up significant threats. I'm sure many of you have seen the ransomware attacks that have happened to communities in this state as well as communities throughout the country that have shown the example of how creative cyber criminals can be from everything from stealing your actual assets to limiting your systems. It's some really scary stuff. And so this may be a little bit more proactive, a little bit more resourcing and education, but getting our communities on a collective standard on cybersecurity so that our systems are safe. Uh, secure state systems, that's a hard thing to say altogether, but just making sure that we have continuity across our different communities and large and small, and especially those who operate municipal utilities are able to do that meaningfully and well. Uh, elections, you know, we, we of course support the full funding of local elections. We have the implementation of Proposal 2, and so that's something that we're really excited to be engaged with the legislature about, but also thinking in the future for everything that we've experienced and for all the feedback that our clerks have given us, making sure that we are appropriately resourcing them and collectively utilizing our partners to do so. Now, when we think about human capital and physical infrastructure, one, infrastructure can be defined more broadly than you just see here as maybe roads, bridges, transit, and water and sewer. Um, but I do want to draw attention to the fact that while we in this committee may never have a direct discussion on roads, uh, but I do see Rep. Shannon as chair of the House Transportation Committee on here and uh, Representative Hoskins as uh, chair of the Economic Development Committee, understanding that the threads that are tied between these issues become really important. 
if we think about these committees in silos, we run the risk that we don't actually connect the dots between the things that are being done in one versus the things that are being done in the other. So how is it when we talk about infrastructure in, in one committee that we're coming back into this committee and making sure that it's supporting the work that's being done there? Or if we talk about economic development and the importance role that we play in it at the local level, how is, how is that tying to the structure in which we're helping to create here, whether that be through Public Notices or Open Meetings Act or FOIA? And there's a number of other threads that we could tie, but to highlight the fact that we need to be very conscious in our efforts to understand what's going on at multiple levels at the local level to ensure that we're not pulling the string in one direction and then impacting it negatively in the other, but really using this system to uplift communities as a whole, because ultimately at the end of the day, we are here and responsible for then passing that on as a benefit to those that we represent as residents or businesses or visitors. Public safety is a huge priority for us as well. I know we'll be doing this work, in, like John mentioned, in many different committees, but especially funding, supporting, and something that hasn't been talked along too much, but the sustainability of the workforce in public safety. We have a lot of succession planning to do, especially through local government, and looking for ways that we can support the workforce capacity of that, um, as well as ensuring that for compensation, for training, and for all those ever broad investments that, you know, can be narrowly looked at a lot of times as police, you know, investments, but really are collectively community culture deciding to make these investments and prioritize these things are stuff that we're looking to do in the future as well. Generating robust housing and economic development opportunities. I can't highlight enough what John just said about those threads that run through all of these dis different issue areas because when you're talking about economic development area, strategic investment, again, that foundation is that place, that local municipality where someone's looking to invest, um, thinking about where their workers can, will live, the school systems, uh, and it's so important. and so. Housing-wise, again, that's housing on so many different levels, whether that's income levels, that's just the amount of stock, that's the type of stock, um, some of those other issues that come along with that. Um, but how that touches, um, you know, K through 12 schools, you cannot have successful schools and failing communities, and you cannot have failing communities with successful schools. So those two issue areas walking hand in hand together um, and just strategic investment in looking at, if we're talking about economic development, um, how housing is such a leg of that stool. And um, that is a thought. It's great to lure uh, and attract, I shouldn't say lure, but attract, retain um, companies. But where are people going to live? And making sure that we're highlighting that as part of the conversation on the front end, um, instead of it being an afterthought like it has been. Um, to, to no one's dismay, but just that it has always been an afterthought um, in the past. So now's the time to get to work, uh, in, in our opinion. And, and as we start this new legislative session, you know, we uh, at the local level and, and you as members of the legislature uh, have an opportunity and a moment of opportunity here in Michigan that we can really capitalize on for a lot of different reasons. Um, but, you know, more than anything else, we think at our best, we are innovators and makers in this state. That is unquestionable in our history, and we need to continue to leverage that. Our history, our culture, our sustainable geography, and our great bones will allow us to be in a position to be attractive to anybody that thinks about moving. Whether that be a young college graduate, whether that be a senior, it does not matter. Our systems are equipped and able to handle that, and we need to continue to invest in them. That requires vision, ambition, ownership of those issues, changing expectations of how people see us and what, what we are as a state and who we can be, and the idea that then we need to move forward on that. And it's, it's the can-do that we need to focus on. Uh, oftentimes we find excuses for not doing things. We need to find reasons to do these things. And the more we play in the space of finding reasons to accomplish our goals, the better off we, were, we will be. So in closing, I will leave you with this. A quote that we use very often and I think is important to this committee and those threads that we want to tie across the spectrum. The most valuable resource in the 21st century is brains. Smart people tend to be mobile. Watch where they go. 
because where they go, robust economic activity will follow. That is something for us to consider, something for us to abide by, and something that if we legislate to that fact, undoubtedly will make us successful. So with that, thank you for allowing us to present before you today. Happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yes, we're going to open the floor for questions. I see one here. Representative Breen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the MML. Uh, also, thank you for including a picture of my hometown of Northville in your presentation, even though it's technically Representative Colazar's part of Northville. Um, I love your uh, what you guys have done with placemaking, um, making commu helping people make communities where people live, work, and play. Um, I have two questions sort of folding in to each other, but with revenue sharing, or as I like to call it, pipes, parks, and public safety, because revenue sharing is a very boring term. Where One, where are we at with um, getting those trust fund bills back on track? And two, do you have any proposals on how to resolve the conflicts that have been created by Prop A and Headley? Yeah, so uh, we, we can address both of those. Um, so on the trust fund bills, uh, we we don't get to sign bluebacks, but I do know we have identified some particular sponsors, both in the House and the Senate. Uh, I think, you know, part of what we need to do with any new legislature is make sure that we educate first. And so we're trying to have some conversations with people to not just understand the concept of revenue sharing and where we've been historically and some of the issues that have happened with that uh, as cuts have taken place over the last decade and a half. And we've slowly started to add resources back to it. So I know, you know, one of the things that, that is always when we talk about this, say the legislature's cut revenue sharing, which may be a true statement, but none of you on the committee today have actually taken the vote to do that. There's been increases in revenue sharing over the course of you know, the last four, five, six years. But how do we get to a point where we understand what the value of that is and what the importance of securing those resources long, long term, which is the purpose of the trust fund? And so as we go out and talk with committees like this, as we have individual meetings with members, we're addressing that very directly. And I think we will be in a position to have that legislation in particular introduced here soon. Uh, when it comes to the interaction of Headley and Proposal A, there's a couple of different things that happen that we've focused on. Uh, and Representative Ellison had a bill last year that dealt with this directly. I think we looked it up yesterday. It was 5337 for those that are interested. Uh, and it addresses two issues, right? Because at the local level right now, it is very difficult for us based on the pressures that it created between that interaction between Headley and Proposal A to really track with the economy. And so while we may have downturns in the economy and, and communities as a result would have impacts to their revenue system, the way in which the economy grows happens at a much faster rate than what local units can recover. And that has to deal with the fact that there is a cap that is in uh, this that deals with our ability to raise property taxes by the rate of inflation or 5%, whichever is less. Now, we have an overall um, cap in there, uh, constitutional-based, but it's the growth after that that we're trying to attract. So how quickly can we get back to that baseline level we were pre-recession? And so that was one of the focuses of the Ellison bill, uh, rather than that slow, gradual climb out of there. And then the other addresses what's known as the millage reduction fraction. And normally I wouldn't dive deep into the millage reduction fraction, but since you guys are focused on municipal finance, we will do that for a second. Um, but think about if you were to purchase a home today, right? You as the individual home buyer will experience an increase in that property tax compared, quite frankly, to the previous owner. We commonly refer to that as the pop-up, right? That pop-up then is captured by the community overall to help derive uh, resources for their budgets. But if you happen to reach that Headley cap within there, you will see a gradual rollback of every other piece of property tax that's applied to other residential properties uh, roll back slightly. So we don't capture the full amount of that pop-up. And, and what we are trying to do uh, with the millage reduction fraction is decouple that uh, to those two things and really allow us at the community to capture the full impact of that pop-up while not having any uh, increase or negative impact on anybody else's property taxes. And that cap is easily reached sometimes if your community or municipality has just had um, some investment in existing uh, businesses um, that are in there that have expanded or have um, had any kind of investment in them that easily hits uh, that cap and then triggers that rollback. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I should mention, if you have a question, please uh, grab the attention of either Vice Chair or the Clerk, and we can get you down for questions. With that, Representative Bizat. On a lighter note, uh, enjoyed working with you last session. Great presentation. But, John, I swore you told me that uh, your newest member was going to give us a 20-minute presentation on public safety. So <laughs> Representative Harris and I are very disappointed. <laughs> That's next, and we didn't prepare him at all. He's just going to get called up. You spoiled it. You'll always remember this. I threw you under the bus. <laughs> Leave your mark, I guess, right? Um, Representative Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, don't have a question, just a statement. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I am very proud of the strong and active partnership that my city, the city of Sterling Heights, has had with the MML. So much so, and it's a little bit of a plug here, that my former colleague on the uh, Sterling Heights City Council, Barb Ziarko, is the current MML president. Um, and I also want to give uh, you know some accolades to the elected officials academy. I, when I first joined the city council back in Sterling Heights, they, we, my uh, administration was highly uh, they encouraged me uh, a lot to to, uh, to take on the uh, elected officials academy, so I did uh, complete level one and thought it was great for somebody that didn't have a lot of background in local government to get that sort of base information. And I worked towards credits after that too, so someday I would actually like to complete the whole the whole uh, course because it was really good. So those of you that have uh, you know people in your community that are on local government, uh, the elected official officials academy is a really great resource that the MML provides, I think, maybe a couple times a year. So yeah. it's definitely, I didn't know if you wanted to speak on it, uh, John, or anyone else, but uh, I, I really appreciated it and learned a lot. I, I will just mention one thing, which our elected official academy is amazing. Um, but that, that being said, you know, one of the core functions of, of the organization, while you see us as advocates, you know, here before you today, is education uh, and making sure that those individual elected officials, which there are over 4,000 of them at the local level just for cities and villages have access to the information that they need to be successful in their role uh, representing their constituents. And so we take that very seriously. It's something that, as you saw in the timeline here, that we really engaged in deeply beginning back in 1935. And that has been ingrained in our organization ever since then and will continue to be because it is one of the more valuable services that we can provide to those that are new to this and even those that have been around for some time. I mean, there's always more to learn, and I think that that is what we focus on as an organization as things and times change. Thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding housing, and you mentioned stock and development and all these exciting things, but one thing that you did mention there just briefly was housing type. And there is kind of a modernization to the type of housing that we do see both in urban cores and then also in exurb and even rural areas. And so I'm curious to know if you could maybe just expand upon the benefits of diversifying that housing type and what that can do for a community. Well, I think even in, in talking about type, you can be talking about density and increasing that density at a light pace that um, if someone's thinking about density, it's a lot of times it's scary. Um, actually, so as John mentioned, our training, our advocacy team, um, we have a labs and policy team that's our on the ground staff that works directly with um, communities and state partners. And a project that we recently uh, have finished up the first phase of in our end of phase two is our, um, our pattern book homes for the 21st century. These are actual blueprints of houses, um, looking at them, uh, and these are to fit in existing neighborhoods where maybe you want to add density, but you're going to look at it, it looks like a single family home, and it could be a duplex or a quad. Um, and we are, we are free sourcing that information and working with um, the State Housing Development Authority as well as the MEDC um, and putting those projects together. So we are trying to give our members uh, resources and solutions and, and also the fact of talking about development and time is money, um, that if this is something that fits into their plans and vision and their community is bought into, then these are things that they should be allowing by right to be permitted. Um, but definitely stock. 
things are changing, um, what people are looking for and want to live in is different. Um, if you want the larger home on a larger lot with yard, those are available. But if you also, you know, are different and want something where you, uh, I'm fortunate to have a neighbor who is a landscaper, uh, I don't have time for yard work. My husband, we own a small business. My husband doesn't have time for yard work, even though he would love to do it and always says he's going to. But those <laughs> options are available and um, where you can live in, in a space and still be downtown and be walking into you know, close amenities and, and things that interest you. And again, protecting that so there are a diverse set of choices um, for people where they want to live and what kind of housing they want to live in. Well, and I, I think you might too wonder like why are we doing all this as an organization like why do we have a pattern book why do we have eoa why do we do that a lot of the reason we're stepping into this space right now is capacity right a at the local level you know capacity to do things has been eroded over the time right rep harris you and i and harrisana were talking about this the other day just on the public safety front um you know but capacity at the local level is critical to us being successful and so when you don't have the capacity to do these things, we have been fortunate as an organization to help fill that gap for our members. I think part of what we want to do, obviously, is to continue in that role as an organization, but also put our members in a position, unlike they've been in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, to have some of that capacity on the ground. When you just look at what's happening right now, I mean, there are resources available federal resources, state resources, and I'm not talking about the resources you haven't allocated yet. I'm talking about resources that have been allocated. How do those uh, communities get access to that? Do they have those individuals within that community to actually go out and understand how to write a grant, even know that it's available? do those types of things and so how do we build that capacity whether that be in individual communities or in a larger structure to make sure we leverage to the maximum amount those resources that are available because again that gets back to being competitive that get back to that global economy aspect and so we don't want others to have those resources we want those resources here so let's put us in a position to go get them great thank you mr vice chair thank you uh, I'm certainly uh, happy to be sitting with you here today. Uh, after 30 years in, in local government, I, I feel so comfortable here that uh, it's, a, it's a great feeling. But, you know, one of the things that is always difficult to do, and I, I, I pledge to, to help try and work through it, is, is trying to bring together uh, cities and villages and townships and, and county government. And that's one of the, the issues I see is so hard to balance those three entities. Um, so I, I look forward uh, to working with you and this committee uh, in trying to uh, uh, help balance those, those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions that we are missing here? Yes, Representative Hoskins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I just want to also add that it's always been great working with the League, uh, both in my capacity uh, as a legislative staffer here as well as on the Southfield City Council. And I'm definitely looking forward to working with you guys uh, in the future. I, I just kind of want to touch a little bit more on the Open Meetings Act and what are some of the things that you are hoping to that we can modernize potentially with that act? Yeah. So one of those things would be the ability for virtual meetings um, in in certain, and we are very open. And when I say we, um, the league, working with the township association, working with the counties, working with schools, um, all have been working together on this issue and talking about this. Um, but modernizing as in looking, going, having some ability for that virtual attendance, um, as well as uh, uh, there was a bill last year that actually was clarifying and simplifying the Open Meetings Act so that your average citizen could try to understand that act without having to be uh, an attorney. And so that is uh, a big one for us too, is just simplifying and clarifying so that um, that act is there so people understand um, it and can be able to utilize it. But the virtual, the virtual attendance um, is definitely a step with the technology um, that we have in, in today. But definitely open, again, to guardrails because, no, there are, are, there are a lot of um, you know, hiccups along talking that way. 
Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. The roadshow is getting really great. You're polished up. This is this is great. I think that I'm sure that this is probably the third or fourth that some of us have heard. But thank you so much. This was very good to hear. We look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Um, but your presentation today was wonderful and a good level set for us as we begin our work here on this committee. Thank you very much. Um, I would also mention too. You know, the city of Wyoming, I heard a lot of plugs for different cities. The city of Wyoming has also enjoyed our partnership with the MML, especially as we embark on a new chapter, as we say goodbye to uh, our city manager, who has been a longtime supporter of the MML. Uh, and uh, I know he wishes you all the best. I'm sure the same to him. So thank you very much. With that, uh, with no members absent and no further business before this committee, we need a motion to adjourn. Rep. Burns moves to adjourn. Hearing no objections, the committee is adjourned.